Um, so my name is Wendy Norris. I wanted to welcome you all officially here this evening. I'm very excited to hear this conversation between Gary Garrels and Peter Young. I've been looking forward to it for weeks now, and I thank you all for coming. I um, am not one on long and formal introductions where I read all the details, uh, but to that end, there are a few things that we should all know about Gary Garrels that we might not already know. Um, as you know, he's the, the uh, Elise Haas Senior Curator of Painting and Sculpture at SF MoMA. I think he's an extraordinary member of our arts community here in San Francisco and that he actually is a curator who is out and about and visiting all of the gallery shows um, with curiosity and a lot of energy and, and that's something that we gallerists here in the Bay Area appreciate. And not only that, I've watched him work feverish, feverishly with his staff over the last few years to open uh, the new SF MoMA about a block here from the gallery. And uh, as many of you all know, it's, it's a real treasure for our city and for the art world and beyond. So a lot of that is due to Gary's constant work um, on the curatorial front and on the development front and everything else that he has on his plate. Uh, I'm really excited about his current show. He just got back from New York, uh, like midnight last night. He was uh, in New York uh, on a symposium uh, for Bruce Connor, where MoMA um, opened a, the Bruce Connor show that Gary has really been spearheading for all these years. That exhibition opens here at SF MoMA, I believe, on October 29th, and we're really excited about it. Bruce Connor is an artist that. Um, I think contributed uh, vastly to uh, the 20th century art and, and beyond. Um, so Peter Young, I, uh, I won't do a formal introduction for Peter either. Um, the funny thing about Peter, I was just going back and forth with a reporter the other day who really wanted to categorize him. Is he an abstract painter? Is he a surrealist? Is he a post minimalist? What, how, they wanted one single word to describe him. And, and, you know, that's the great thing about Peter Young. He's indescribable. And I'm hoping that tonight we'll all get a sense of, um, you know, what he's all about and why he's here in this gallery. Um, he's 76 years old and he had an amazing career starting in New York. Um, and I think he owes a lot of it to um, Richard Bellamy, Dick Bellamy, who is um, or was an extraordinary force in the art world and beyond. And from there, he showed with all of the great galleries and many of the great museums and knew so many people, and I could listen to him talk for hours. Um, the one thing about Peter Young that you might not hear tonight um, that you should all know is there is a great HBO documentary coming out. It premieres next month at the New York Film Festival about Peter. And it's, it's entitled um, The Brillo Box, Three Cents Off. And it's really about the story of these collectors. There's an actor who pay, plays Peter, but Peter is also featured. Um, these collectors who own a really important Andy Warhol piece that they decide to sell. And they decide to sell it because they want to support Peter Young. And it's this really wonderful journey about the art world and the importance of a collector and the, and the market itself. And it's actually going to be playing here at the uh, Napa Valley Film Festival. And then it will show and be broadcasted next year on HBO. So it's another insight into his very <laughs> colorful can, can personality. I, oh, I'm, I'm live here. Uh, yeah, it's live. really not a documentary about me. I'm a, I haven't seen it, but I'm a shadowy figure that <laughs> occurs. Always the shadowy figure. Because the filmmaker's dad bought a Brillo box out of the first show or even before, maybe from uh, uh, Ivan, I'm not sure, but, uh, and it was a unique one that uh, instead of being red, white, blue, and black, had a yellow emblem on it that said three cents off. <laughs> and so the title of the film is Brillo Box, Three Cents Off. And uh, so the filmmaker grew up with that in their New York apartment. And uh, there's a photo of her bare butt naked on top of it. It was used as a coffee table uh, with, with a plexi top with, uh, <laughs> protection. And uh, uh, her, her dad, after a few years, sold it because its value had appreciated tremendously. And uh, so he bought a piece of mine at that point. So that's how I come into the story. And uh, eventually the 
that that exact Brillo box has been sold, I think, f four or maybe five times, and it's now worth a lot. Her, her, her premise was, because it's one of four unique edition, uh, her premise was going to the collectors, why did you buy that? And why did you sell it? <laughs> so it's really a film about the art market, uh, evidently. Uh, and I'm such a shadowy figure that uh, she hired a young actor and we set up in my studio a young actor playing me in 1966 or 68 and we had the, a couple of paintings to use as background and the kid wore my black beret and my cape and, uh, uh, and was filmed. I even got him to paint dots, you know, and they showed him. So Don't give away the entire film, please. I haven't... <laughs> I, I can't really imagine how she's used, she's trying to make a, a myth about me. Yeah. Well, let them be the judge. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gary Garrels, and thank you so much for being here, both of you. Well, thank you, Wendy, uh, Wendy, and thank you for bringing this exhibition here and for bringing Peter. I have to say, until tonight, I got here a little bit ago and had not met Peter Young. Uh, and uh, even though I've been aware of Peter Young for a long time, but somehow our paths hadn't crossed. So I was super excited about the chance to meet, meet Peter tonight and to have this conversation. So we started a little bit in Wendy's office, and I'm a little kind of an obsessive about uh, biographical detail in history and this kind of thing. And uh, so I was trying to get a little clarity. So we, I, can, I can already clarify that Peter was born in Pittsburgh, but in the hospital in Pittsburgh. That's, he didn't grow up in Pittsburgh, you know? And clarify this, he was, uh, can we say a little bit of a country boy? Or out, out, out in a, outside of Pittsburgh and grew up in a, a, sounds like a really beautiful bucolic pastoral paradisical kind of place. Blueberries, yeah. wild strawberries. Yeah, so when you read the biographies as Born Pittsburgh, I'm thinking, okay, you know, he's been choking on steel mill <laughs> smut for, you know, 10 years, and, you know, he's already lost some brain cells before he moves, the family moves to Santa Monica, uh, which, you know, in the, uh, this would have been about, what's the late 40s, I guess? And 49. 49, I think the yeah. family arrived in 50. Yeah, and so in Santa Monica, you think, well, then that is pretty paradisical, and you know about that, about that point, and uh, um, and um, uh, studied there. I, I grew up there and studied at Pomona College, and moved to New York in 1960, and and we're going to come back to LA and spend some time there or Santa Monica. But I just uh, and it wasn't in 1963 started painting. Uh, he'd studied art history, but, and I think this is important, you know, I mean, I have to say we are, we're at a point historically where it's almost impossible to imagine an artist who, you know, didn't get their MA at art school, <laughs> you know, but in the, you know, it didn't used to be that way, and there's still fortunately a few uh, people who don't follow that path, as good as that path can be. Um, but, uh, but in 1966, and, and Wendy alluded to this already, uh, an amazing fellow who I did ha get to know somewhat in New York named Dick Bellamy came to the studio, bought some paintings, and asked Peter if he could represent him. And that's kind of, I would say, the beginning of the formal entry into the art world. Yes and no. Uh, I had been... Uh a, as much of a poet as a painter as I came out of uh, Pomona and moved to New York. Uh, and uh, I was pretty entrenched in a little poetry world which quickly led to the Fluxus people. And uh, so uh, that's different than the art world, but it's better. Well, <laughs> and, and there were, there were very, painting did not play a big part in Fluxus. No, no, no. Uh, uh, yeah, see, I'm trucking around New York with Twyla, and we're, we're two young... Twy Twyla Tharp, just for the record. Kind of golden children from California. 
and uh, like Ray Johnson loved us, you know. So he started sending us oh. stuff and see. So uh, Yoko Ono had a, a studio loft on Flint Street or something, mm. uh, way deep Lower East Side, and she was having concerts of new music, mm -hmm. uh, uh, avant-garde music. Uh, so that's way before I started painting, but that's the, an, uh, the art world. Well, we, maybe we should start there with like what, what it means to be part of a creative community. I mean, that's, I think. Yeah, I owe it all to my friends. You, you say uh, Richard Bellamy helped me, but my friends helped me. We were a young community of artists downtown, and uh, we worked uh, in uh, trucking art as much as anything, uh, and sometimes helping uh, install shows uh, for galleries. So, so the network of young painters, before any of us hit the the ropes, you know, no, that's not the right. <laughs> uh, uh, was incredibly vital, you know, we, yeah. we, we spent all night uh, uh, talking to each other, maybe drinking in the bars, but uh, visiting each other's studios yeah. more than anything, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, tracking each other's work and talking about it. So, uh, b definitely before Bellamy, Oh yeah, I mean, uh, just kind of like the formal kind of emergence into the art world. And, and so it made it, I would say, and it was a very quick emergence. Cause with, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so, so Dick asked uh, 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 one of the artists in the group who was probably more out there than uh, at the bars than we were, uh, who's, who do you like? Who should I look up, you know? And he said, Dan Christensen and Peter Young. And so Dick came to my studio. Uh, you were wrong, he didn't actually buy paintings, but he immediately started, he never bought a painting, but he immediately started bringing, uh, Philip Johnson was one of the first. Uh, um, Robert Skull, Vera List, Holly Solomon, big collectors. Yeah, Dick had a gallery called the Green Gallery that was like the epicenter for the new art in New York. And I think that opened in about 1963, and I'm pretty sure that Robert Skull was his backer. Uh -huh. So he was, he was right in the thick of it. Uh, in the, and in basically the all those pop artists uh, that were in the Green Gallery were picked up by other galleries, because yeah. for some reason Green closed, it crashed and burned. And so Dick was in a sense looking for a new crop of artists. Yeah, makes sense. So let's start. And he back. found it. And he did, and he kept finding him. And uh, Dick, Dick then, uh, in later years, had a gallery called Oil and Steel, uh, which was in Tribeca, one of the early galleries down there, and did a show in 1984 with, with, with Peter. But let's circle back to Santa Monica in the 50s. And uh, yeah. uh, the, the... You say Santa Monica. Or, uh, uh, I basically... Palisades? Well, I think we were officially the Palisades, yes. Yeah. But it was Santa Monica Canyon, yeah, okay. uh, which was just heaven on earth, you know, the, uh, uh, the strip of Sunset Boulevard uh, that ran up there uh, was called the Riviera. <laughs> the country club was called the Riviera Country Club, and it was truly like the, the Riviera, the, the way people built their homes overlooking the ocean on the Palisades, and the amount of wealth, you know, and sophistication that was going on uh, uh, out there. I always uh, knock people out by naming all the movie stars, kids that I grew up with, you know. Uh, 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 like growing up with Mitchum and his kids, that was cool. <laughs> but probably more important were uh, people like Lee and Lucita Mulligan. Well, yeah, the other Mulligans, no, the creative community. My parents uh, indulged in knowing the creative community. My dad was a good friend of Charles Eames, uh, and that was great. My, my mother worked for, for people who uh, knew uh, Anais Nin uh, academically and, 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 and socially and stuff. So, uh, but yeah, let's see, my high school buddy, 
Daniel Delsilar uh, was the stepson, half the, was the, was the uh, a son of Lee Mulliken uh, and Luchita Mulliken. Right. And uh, when I was about 15 years old, uh, Lee Mulliken is a well-known uh, California artist. Uh, uh, and uh, at the age of 15, I started hanging out in his house. Uh, my dad was a big scientist, and Daniel Delsilar, my classmate, uh, was, had a very good mind for science and stuff. So uh, he liked my family and I liked his family because they were not scientific or, or, or <laughs> uh, they were the free and easy, uh, particularly Lucita. And uh, uh, so I'm seeing uh, in that household uh, uh, art from the Americas. I'm seeing uh, a collection of art that comes from Chile to New Mexico to, to Africa, not much, but to the Caribbean and uh, uh, wonderful magical objects. And Luchita becomes one of my great teachers. I was saying she's like my art teacher, but uh, that's not really true. And I thought about it, she was my spiritual teacher. And she showed me the power that a work of art can have because, because that's what she indulged in. Uh, yeah, just to clarify, Lee uh, Mulliken lived in the Bay Area, of, uh, I think they, about, about 1948, moved here, and was one, a member of a group called the Dinatin Group. There were three members, Wolfgang Pollen uh, and... Uh, Gordon Oslo Ford. Gordon Oslo Ford and, uh, and Lee Mulliken. And, uh, there was a show at the San Francisco Museum of Art the SF moment now, uh, in 1951 of that, that work. And then in about 19, and then uh, Luchita had been married to uh, Wolfgang Pollen and then had an affair with Lee Mulliken. <laughs> and they got married <laughs> and became a wonderful couple and a wonderful family. And uh, in about 1953, moved to LA. And, uh, that's, and their home then was... Uh, in LA, we, we, uh, the Bay Area lost Lee Mulliken in about 53, even oh, though yeah. there were still connections up here. But John Mulliken is in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hope we're not speaking out of school here. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we're, I have to say we're thrilled. I don't know if, if people have been on the museum, but we now have galleries specifically dedicated for California art. We have this incredible triptych by Lee Mulliken from 1952 that's up right now in the museum. But, but Lee was a, also an important figure for you, I think, as a, you said, and Luchita is a spiritual uh, kind of uh, teacher, but maybe you could talk a little I, bit about... I, th I think that, that uh, well, for, first of all, the, uh, those painters were... Uh, abstractionists. Mm -hmm. They were surrealists, but they were abstract surrealists. And uh, I think that was, that was important for me to actually see that. Also, Lee, uh, his paintings are, are incremental. They're made up of many, many marks. And, uh, and I actually, you know, when I'm 16 years old or something, I actually made a Lee Mulliken. I got a little trowel <laughs> and I made all the lines like that. Uh, I gave it to some family friends, you know, but how embarrassing. I made a Lee Mulliken. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but Lee was a very reticent person. Hmm. And even though I shared many dinners in the Mulliken household, uh, it was really hard to get Lee. Hmm. I don't know why that was, was true. You know, and I'm sure it wasn't always true. Uh, uh, but um, so I can't say I mean I, I, I can remember more memorable things that Luchita told me about mm. art uh, uh, something like it's always figurative whatever it is it's always figurative <laughs> <laughs> I like that <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the, the whole uh, ambiance there uh, was, uh, uh, who, who was there? Gerald Hurd, a, a great spiritual teacher. Sam Francis lived around there. So it wasn't just movie stars. It was all these incredible intellectuals. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then, then I'm sure 
Well, I mean, you know, Henry Miller and Anais Nin, uh, just living up the way and uh, not together. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it that, that then pulled you to New York? Because I, I was saying, in 1960, you made Oh, them... totally Twyla. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we'd had a couple of years at Pomona College, and uh, uh, we got together, and her family was freaked out because <laughs> they wanted her to become a great dancer. She has the world's greatest Hollywood mom, uh, Twyla's mom, and uh, so they quickly sent her, enrolled her in Barnard College to get 3,000 miles away from me, uh, uh, and uh, I was in New York before she got there. <laughs> I hitchhiked across country. I had a, another runaway from Pomona College, uh, David Bays, who uh, uh, said that, hey, I'm going to the Art Students League and uh, I have a really cheap rent here and New York is kind of great, you know, and uh, uh, why don't you come and go to the Art Students League, which I did for a little while. Uh, uh, but yeah, I was there before Twyla and uh, so they sent uh, Grandma from Indiana to... This is personal <laughs> history, God. <laughs> uh, to uh, live with Twyla uh, on Riverside Drive and make sure that uh, everything was above board. <laughs> you know, so we were able to bundle. They're Quakers, you know, with the board and everything. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but, so eventually, but she, uh, they, did, they are Quakers. So eventually, uh, Grandma said, I, I can't keep these two young people apart. And uh, she... Uh, cashed in and went home to Indiana. <laughs> so the family said we had to get married, so we got married. But anyway, that got you to New York. So, I'll, I'll, and we're gonna, we can certainly circle back to these things. I want, we definitely want to make sure there's some Everybody always wants to know why I, that's a good question, why did I go to New York in the first place? They always want to know why did I leave New York? Well, then that's my next question. Oh, I'll, see. Uh -huh. because, because I'll say, because as I said, uh, you know, uh, started working with Dick Bellamy uh, who uh, and and then had shows uh, in uh, it was all happening I was in a biennial yeah. I was in documenta it was all way happening yeah. Yeah, for yeah. me very easily uh, and, uh, and, and, a, and then a show with Leo Castelli in 1969 with two other artists and you weren't there for the opening because you were in, in Costa Rica, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually I didn't even know that was going to happen. That was some set up between Dick Bellamy and Leo Castelli and I received a letter many months later in the jungles of Costa Rica saying you better come home for your show at Leo Castelli and it had already happened. <laughs> so you were and cover of Art Forum 1971. Um, so you were in the thick of it, uh, celebrated, you know, I mean, every young artist's dream, right? And you decided to leave. I mean, you were in Costa Rica and you really didn't go back. That's like, you know, you're you gambling. Know? Do you just keep gambling? No, you cash in your chips. <laughs> <laughs> you leave, you know. Uh, you know, I was on a roll and I figured it would last forever. You know, I figured I had it wired like that, you know, mm. and I did for a while, uh, living in the uh, uh, Southwest. I, I, for a while I did, uh, but then it, it they slowed down and then uh, Leo died and then Dick died and so I didn't have any co connection to New York at all. Uh, and then, uh, I, so I figured I went 38 years without having a solo gallery show. Well, no, you did it. I'm sorry. I'll put it, uh, Dick did a show in 1984 in in New York, uh -huh, Oil and Steel, uh -huh. right? And then I think, well, I can't remember when the it, I, nothing happens. I think until uh, probably uh, Wolfgang Hausler in uh, Zurich. Yeah, and uh, and. Um, uh, there were some shows, I mean, a, 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 I think a terrific gallery, a guy named Dan Weinberg, uh, who had had a gallery here in, in San Francisco for some years, and uh, but had roots in L.A., and he went back to L.A., and he did a, a one-person show in 2003. 
Okay, so 84 <laughs> to 2003. No, you're wonderful, and I've been saying 38 years, so that's not really true, but like 20 years. Anyways, there was a, there was a gap, uh -huh. let's say, uh -huh. but, but there, there was some activity. Uh, another really wonderful gallery, Texas Gallery, uh, Frederica, uh, you know, she's great. I mean, so you had, there was some things going on, but you... Just you, enough to keep me alive, you know, and both those shows at uh, Weinberg and at Texas Gallery were simply small, very tiny works on paper. Uh, they weren't even paintings. Okay, good to know. Here we clarify. Because they never tell you that when you look at, you know... That you looks good. Show. Yeah, yeah. Show. <laughs> they want, yeah, they don't want you to know that. So I want to ask, though, what, what was it that, that, uh, that attracted you or you felt like you, when you went to Bisbee, Arizona, that the Southwest, that here was a place to live? What was that? Uh, okay, well, I had uh, traveled around the Southwest as a child. My dad would take us to the Hopi Mesas. Uh, uh, Oak Creek Canyon, we spent the summer there once, below Flagstaff. Uh, then as a 18-year-old mm, uh, uh, freshman in college, my friend and I took a monumental driving trip around uh, the Four Corners states. You know, we took a long drive, and I, had re I remembered from that trip that Utah was extraordinarily beautiful. And uh, so when I left New York, I flew to Salt Lake. I bought a van. Uh, I found a, a woman to travel with. And I took off and I visited the Four Corners states for about a year. I visited the communes at that point. There were uh, a Llama Foundation and uh, there were a bunch of communes in uh, uh, New Buffalo. and. Da, da, da. It was a whole world uh, of, of post-hippie or return to the earth stuff. And uh, those are my people. <laughs> uh, so so uh, how did I get to Bisbee? I actually made a mistake and I bought a spring, uh, 40 acres with a spring right in the middle of it that's above Zion Park. It's heaven. It's just the most amazing place with the ponderosa forest and the aspen trees and everything like that. But it was 7,400 feet high, and uh, I realized I couldn't winter there. It was so f it was like 45 miles on dirt roads, muddy, bad dirt roads, and I couldn't really live there. I had to visit there in the summer, so I did that for a few summers. One summer I went uh, to uh, uh, Spain for the summer, I mean for the winter, and. Uh, then uh, the next winter, I decided to go to Mexico and uh, speaking to uh, uh, my other spiritual teacher, he said, uh, the world's finest azurite comes from Bisbee, Arizona, better than any, anything that comes from Chessy, France, or other known sites that have exquisite azurite. And uh, as, as my teacher, he, he had a certain fondness for azurite. Uh, uh, the a very consistent crystal, like all crystals. Uh, so he said, you, the, you should just, instead of going through Nogales, you know, on the highway, you should go across uh, at Bisbee, there's a little border crossing there called Naco. So, uh, but check out the Azurite. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, I drove into this town uh, <clears throat> one like early September day and it had just rained. The whole town was, is made of red brick and it was so beautiful and it, it was a, a very, very, very rich mine and they burned down, so they built the whole town uh, in brick with uh, Italian masons that built arches. The whole town is filled with brick arches. Uh, it, it's a real architectural monument, and people come to study it. But, uh, uh, oh, I'm bragging too much about my town. <laughs> <But> <laughs> it stinks and it's toxic from all that. Uh, you wouldn't want to drink the water. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's just a big tourist town now. Uh, uh, no, it is. It, its creative period is long past. But we brought every great poet in America to Bisbee when we were doing our uh, public art period. 
and we got money. We had the Bisbee Poetry Festival. Uh, from San Francisco came, uh, well, Alan and Peter, they don't really come from San Francisco, but uh, uh, Michael McClure, uh, Brother Antoninus, William E. Everson, uh, Duncan. Certainly Robert Duncan. Uh, uh, Alice Adams. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was fabulous. Joanne Kiger. Uh, I mean, we had every great poet in America. Uh, uh, we had, for seven years, seven times six, we had 42 poets over a seven year period. And that enabled us to have every great poet. Uh, uh, Robert Creeley, I got to walk around, hike around town with Robert Creeley. He's just uh, Jerome Rothenberg, a lot of great New Yorkers, Jackson McLow, yeah. Leroy, uh, Jane Cortez. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, all of them, Mae Swenson. Uh, uh, yeah. So I wanted, we, and we'll come back. That's sure, my we'll cultural start. programming period, yeah. Circle back, but I want to talk a little bit about the paintings that are here in front of us. Uh, I think we there are works uh, in the show. If I want to remember correctly, I want to say they start in '89, something like that, up to about 2000. And if you might just talk a little bit about kind of where these paintings are coming from, uh, what were the things that. Uh, maybe you were looking at, or I don't know what, uh, thinking about. Well, okay. uh, these are uh, called ellipses. Yeah, ellipses. Uh, they're filled with uh, elliptical shapes, which are my cardboard tools. I, would, I had a whole lot of cardboard ellipses, some of them almost round, some of them very long, attenuated ellipses. And uh, so that's, that's where the line element comes from. But, Basically, I had uh, painted the, the grid paintings, the plaid paintings, the Oaxaca paintings. I, ha I had made 27 paintings, which were all a single line, and more line, and more line, and more line, hand-painted lines. Uh, I figure I painted a line, you know, from Bisbee to Oaxaca. I mean, it's just, I always was painting this line. I'd move the painting. I'd find myself all slow forward. I'd move the painting up. I start painting the line again. <laughs> and then I'd turn the painting this way and paint the other lines because they're all grids and stuff. I had been doing that. I made 27 paintings in those two modes. And I was painting uh, four paintings a year. So I spent many years at my loom. I would say I'm weaving with paint. And they'd say, isn't that tedious? And I'd say, no, I don't even have to think about it. I just sit here at my loom and, and, I, and I do that, you know, very meditative. Uh, so, but I had done that for so long, so tight. And the dot paintings were pretty tight too, you know. Uh, uh, so I wanted to throw paint, right? It was like I'd always, been so jealous of people that got to throw paint, you know. Uh, so uh, that explains the fact that the backgrounds are. Uh, I had done some dot paintings at one point with some in Spain. I I I, I drank cheap red wine, and I'd get real drunk, and I'd have a six foot canvas on the floor and I'd like do, do something, you know, trying to be as completely kind of out of my mind as possible. <laughs> this is good. because then you paint dots over it so you can fix it. You, anything that's wrong with the, the original throwdown, you can, and that's what happens here too, you know. Uh, uh, so I, I do my, uh, my, my 10 minute painting uh, and I let it dry. And it's, always, it's, it's always done down, it's not, not done upright. Yeah. Uh, but you'll notice in some of the paintings I tipped it up before it was completely dry, so it's like runs going down from the watercolor. It was essentially watercolor as much as acrylic, anything mm -hmm. real transparent. Uh, and then I'd throw down my ellipses and just draw lines all over the whole thing. Uh, hundreds of lines. And then it just becomes the checkerboard effect. If you do this little area, you can't do this one or this one, you have to do that one. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, but then you'll find lots of places where I break with the rule and jump across borders. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> sometimes, you know, because I look ahead and I say, well, I don't want to paint, I don't want to fill those guys in. I'd like to fill those other ones in. So mm -hmm. I find a way to, to switch over. Now, why the ellipse? Uh, I got real interested in the ellipse, again, because of my teacher, uh, who, who had a simple thing. He said, uh, the circle's a human heresy. He says, there's no circles in nature. Circles. And I remember the Stan Freeberg, you know, the comedian Stan Freeberg. Uh, he had a bit about this, this mad German professor who sounded a lot like Henry Kissinger, who was saying the earth is shaped more like a football. It's more like a football. It's not round. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, we think of things as being round, but they probably have a certain dynamics to them that make them not round. I, I accept my guru's teacher, teaching on that one, yeah. <laughs> the circle is a human heresy. So I, I began to think about uh, the ellipse, and I realized, God, the ellipses are beautiful. You know, they're, uh, 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 when you pile them up, not so much in this because the colors are so wild, but they really do create a muscular, figurative stuff, you know, because we're made up of curves. We're very... <laughs> uh. so, so that's about all I can tell you. Yeah. At first, uh, I wanted to do just white. I'm, I'm very much kind of a simple purist, you know, so there's a whole bunch of paintings where all the shapes are simply white uh, on whatever background there is, uh, usually a lot of white also. But then some of those didn't work out, and I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I started, like, filling in colors, you know? So all of a sudden, after doing all these white paintings, <laughs> white on white almost, you know, very... Uh, uh, I had a show in New York of the white ellipse paintings, mm -hmm. and they're very kind of invisible uh, sometimes. Uh, so this was just the next logic. The paint tells you what to do, you know? You have all this yeah. paint. Yeah. So let's say the paint tells you what to do. Okay. <laughs> and, and I just absolutely understand that, that, uh, that uh, that's part of what I, lo I love about the physicality, the materiality of painting, uh, that it, uh -huh. it, uh, it, it, it's, it's not just a, a set of rational decisions that, or a That's plan. something I say the paint tells you what to do, you know. Uh, uh, and I tell that to young artists, you just do something. You gotta just do something and then it'll tell you what to do next, you know. Uh, that's kind of like the paint telling you what to do, uh, I guess. But, you know, I've been thinking and thinking and thinking, what does tell me what to do? <laughs> that's the inner secret, which I'm sure you're not going to reveal here. Huh? So I, I, I'll look you know, no, up here. No, for, no, I mean, don't get off the set. Drugs. Drawings. No. No. Drugs. Drugs. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. We're going to bring that. Yeah. That there were. Yeah. There were certainly some drugs that jumped jumped into the picture at some point in the '60s. I would say probably. Uh. N yeah. No kidding. Actually. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, uh. And I copped to it a little bit once in print. Uh. But now it makes no difference. You know. But yes. I mean. Uh, yes. Uh. 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 We got the finest LSD around 64, yeah. you know, uh, uh, and then we got, uh, a few years later, we got DMT, mescaline. Yeah. So I, I did all those things, you know, and I think that the dot paintings very possibly have a, a psychedelic genesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I certainly remember Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. <laughs> there was, you were in good company. Um, so I want to say, I have to say, there was a fantastic show in New York in 2007 at PS1. Uh, Alana Heiss, who was the founding director and longtime director of PS1, organized a, a show of Peter, a kind of retrospective that I think I saw and I think a lot of people saw, and it was the beginning of another chapter that that um, <clears throat> people who didn't know the early history mm -hmm. caught up with. Mm -hmm. A wonderful essay by Klaus Curtis, who was one of the partners of the Bikert Gallery, one of the great galleries in the New York in the 60s. You know 60s. Who, what curator was really responsible for that is uh, Bob Nikas. Bob Nikas, yep. Yeah. 
uh, uh, I mean, uh, David Deutsch mm -hmm. is my angel, mm -hmm. and he was responsible for mm -hmm. it. But Bob Nikas, Bob Nikas yeah. was the one that actually was able to bring it to PS1. It was a good idea waiting to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. Bob, Bob was kind of an adjunct uh, curator at PS1 for a number of years with projects. And he's, anyway, he's a great critic, a great writer, and a uh, curator. So somebody's yeah. to keep a, a name, name in your mind. But that's a wonderful catalog. I have actually n never looked to see how available it is or not. But I think uh, it's still available. You probably can find it. But if, if you really want to see a survey, but kind it of overview, really well, it's it's yeah. only really for uh, 1963 to 1980. So, hmm. see, there's a whole lot of work yeah. that you haven't seen. That, yeah. you know. I well, mean, this is part of the, it. Yeah, we're picking up here in the uh, 80s. But, but there's a, so, a, a lot of other changes in genres. Since 1980. Yeah. Anyway, let's open it up to some questions uh, and maybe topics we touched on or t things we didn't. Uh, moments, whether from the 50s, 60s, or today. I, I just want to say something about the 50s and 60s briefly. Uh, you know, I've always been thought of as a New York artist. Uh, even the, the local paper here called me a New York artist last week about this show, you know. Uh, uh, which is not really quite true, probably, but uh, I realized that I stood for a New York artist in my career for a long time, but thinking more and more and more about it, I realized that I'm a 50s artist, <laughs> and I received my whole education in the 50s, you know? That's, that's when I knew Lee and Lucita. Uh, that's when I knew uh, Jonathan Williams, the publisher of Jargon Books and the Black Mountain Review. You know, I'm 13 years old and I'm getting an education in the cutting edge of American poetry because my family are friends with Jonathan Williams. Mm. And then I go to Mexico and I meet uh, George and Mary Oppen, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet George Oppen. Do you know? Uh, uh, and, and uh, I have teachers in jazz uh, that, that, from my young teens, schooled me in American jazz. Mm. Do you know? So, uh, poetry, jazz, yeah, art, but also the California ethos that uh, was really foreign to New York ethos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, first question. Oh my God, Peter, please. So I just want to repeat, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I think we need to repeat some of this because I don't think everybody can yeah, hear this. That, that Peter, as I hope everyone knows, Peter was a curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and was talking about that period in 1960 with Bill Seitz who was there and and uh, and Dick Bellamy, who was not a curator, but but and but go, going out to studios every week and seeing young artists, and uh, that's where Dick saw these artists who we now identify as minimal artists, mm -hmm. who were the ones he first showed when he opened the Green mm -hmm. Green Gallery, and. Uh, and it's Bellamy's uh, story is about to be told. Uh, a wonderful scholar named Judith Stein has just finished a massive biography of Dick Bellamy, uh, which is going to be published in a couple of months. So we'll all be reading in the book reviews about Dick Bellamy. Uh, before the Green Gallery, there was the Hansa Gallery. Right. Right? And that was located on Central Park South. 
uh, and uh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> and that was a little before my time, but uh, I did start going to the Green Gallery uh, in 1960 and 61 when I, when we moved to, to New York. So I saw all those important uh, pop and minimal shows that he had. And I didn't know that he was him, or he, you know, because there was never anybody in the gallery. And uh, it had a panel, a shifting panel, and you'd come in and somebody would like open the panel a little bit and look at you and then close the panel. Uh, and, and I think that it's possible that sometimes that wasn't even Dick. Do you know who uh, David White is? Yeah. I th I th yeah, yeah. Yeah. David White. He worked very closely with Bob Rauschenberg and, and still works with the Rauschenberg uh, Foundation. Foundation. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's have another question here. Yeah. No. Question just a, about his relationship with Twyla, and did they ever collaborate? No, we shared a studio for a little short while, uh, which we sanded down the floors so that she could dance, and I started to make my first paintings. Uh, but um, where, where was that? Where, where was that Franklin studio? Franklin Street, 104 Franklin 104 Street. 104 Franklin, okay. And Drive she back. kept that loft for a long time mm -hmm. as, a, as a hidden private rehearsal studio, evidently. Um, in 1963, I went into the U.S. Army because uh, I uh, was afraid I would get drafted. I was out of college, and uh, the word was that they'd put you pretty high on the draft, and people were going to Vietnam. It was real serious, so they said, uh, if you join a reserve unit, uh, you'll probably never be sent. So I became a medic and a dental assistant. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, believe me, being a medic is really has been cool in my life. Yeah, a medic is like a nurse, you know? Uh, so when everybody's, you know, freaking out, I, I can keep a cool head and I, <laughs> sometimes, you know? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I came back from my six months active duty to find that Twyla had taken up with the neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question? I, saw, I thought I saw another hand somewhere. I'm going to jump to the second row. I'm sorry, well, go ahead. Did you start with your painting, the dot paintings, or did they come after? The question was, did he start with the dot paintings, which are the, the paintings that I think probably or were most known at first, or were there other paintings preceding those? Yeah, the, the, the classic dot paintings started in 67, 68, 69. That was, it was a short period when I did the dot paintings. Previous to that, I had done some uh, juvenilia uh, in 63 uh, and 64 that involved dots. So I had thought about dots. In fact, uh, I think the first time I used something like dots, I had a, a book in my library called, I swear to God, it was called Primitive Art. And uh, uh, it had a, a photograph of a, a, a woman's back, an African woman's back, uh, where they had scarified, uh, they had put mud under her back and made lots of dot-like things like that. And it was like these brown dots on a brown surface. It didn't show even much of the woman, you know. It was, and I thought, damn, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. So I think one of my first dot paintings, which I, don't, I lost somewhere, was actually a, br a little brown canvas like this. <laughs> with, and I think I was just using my finger. They were, they were not very round or anything. They were just kind of blop, little blops like that. And, they kind of naturally started going into pyramidal forms or something like that. So there was a kind of design. So I was from the very beginning interested in P, P and D. You know what that is? It was a movement around the yeah. time of op art. P and D, what is it? Pattern and decoration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they said, well, that can't be, you know, uh, Clement Greenberg. You can't. 
have a pattern, you can't be decorative, you know, that's not art. So I immediately thought, yeah, it is. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that's a, probably a good place to stop. Oh. <laughs> that that's the way to go. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to say again this, that, that uh, because of that uh, PS1 show, there was a wonderful uh, article in the Brooklyn Rail, a wonderful mm. kind of independent arts journal based in Brooklyn. Great in paper. Fabulous. Yeah, and still is. And they got so ruined in the, f in, in, in the flood. Did in the flood, that? yeah, yeah, in the hurricane. But I think they, they got some extra support from people and have come back thriving. But anyway, in that article, um, uh, Peter was called a, a, an important role model for young artists uh, because he embodied independent thought and maverick dedication. And I think that sums it up, I hope. Okay, thank you.